This is the Anjanu 10X25 or 25 to 250 mm cinema zoom lens. This lens was manufactured in 1980 and has since been modified to work with modern PL mount cameras. It was also retrofitted to include the standard 0.8 pitch gearing. With the T-stop of T3.7 to T22, it is still on par with most other modern zoom lenses of this size. It's also a par focal design, which means that the focus remains static even as the magnification or focal length changes. It weighs in at just under 6 pounds, which, given its range in T-stop, makes it a pretty lightweight cine zoom. The front element of this lens not only telescopes out almost a full 24 millimeters, but it also rotates. To make matters worse, the minimum focusing distance is a staggering 1.7 meters, or 5.5 feet. There have been a few versions of this lens, but its history is tied to 35mm film cameras. And with only a handful of examples of this lens paired with digital sensors, it was a fantastic opportunity to show off what this lens was capable of. But before I could start using it, there was another question that needed to be answered. When choosing a camera to test this lens out on, I faced a tough challenge, and I needed to look at a few different factors. After all, each project requires a different solution. I had to consider price, quality, and ease of use. I wanted a camera that wasn't going to break the bank on rental price, but that had better quality than my GH5. There are quite a few native Super 35 cameras on the market, including the all-new RE Alexa 35. There's also the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro 12K, the Red AK Helium, and V-Raptor Rhino, as well as the Z-Cam S6, not to mention a litany of full-frame mirrorless cameras that can run APS-C crop mode. However, none of these managed to check all of the right boxes. All that is, but one. This is the Panasonic Vericam LT. It has the same PL mount Super 35 sensor found in the Vericam 35. It originally entered the market in 2016, and at the time was a phenomenal option for lightweight film, documentary, and broadcast work, with exceptional color science using V-Log and the now common dual native ISO. With four different internal hardware and D filters, and 14 stops of dynamic range, as well as a removable IR cut filter, it can shoot in 4K ABC Intra or ProRes 422 10-bit. It has tons of professional I.O. ports, including two SDI ports, Genlock, Timecode, and two XLR audio ports, all powered by an interchangeable gold or V-mount battery plate. For media, it uses a P2 card with a separate SD card slot for proxies, weighing in at 6 pounds, and with the Ingenue, a total package weight of 12 pounds. It's still considerably lighter than most of the competition in its class and form factor. Now, I've used the Panasonic Vericam on a few projects before, and while I like the platform, the reality is in 2023 it's beginning to show its age. A few drawbacks to this system include the fact that it hasn't had a proper update in years, along with the seemingly ghosting of the Panasonic Cinema Division, which at the time of recording hasn't posted anything on Facebook or Instagram in over two years. And with the explosion of box cameras, including Panasonic's own BS1H, the Vericam has been left behind on bit depth, codec selection, chassis size, and resolution options. It also uses a non-standard P2 card, which is basically just a bunch of SD cards soldered together, which can still fetch a really high premium. Which begs the question, does the Panasonic Vericam LT still have anything to offer? Would the vintage Ingenue and the Vericam be a solid combination? Can the seven-year-old cinema camera really still hold its own against modern challengers? Well, in order to find out, I dragged the Vericam LT, the Ingenue 25-250, and five dedicated friends out into the Texas heat to make a film that would pay proper homage to this lens and filmmakers like Sergio Leone and Stanley Kubrick, who created some of the most influential films of the 21st century using zoom lenses.
Shep never made it back home that day. Bless his heart. He wasn't a bad husband, but he wasn't a saint either. Still, though, didn't deserve to die. I had some sleepless nights, sure. But for some reason, revenge never crossed my mind. Sometimes I feel guilty about that. Truth be told, I always felt like I was better off on my own anyway.
Initially, I wrote this film in 2022 with a different ingenue lens and a different camera in mind, so I've had this particular review cooking for a while. However, I'm glad I waited as this pairing performed well beyond my expectations. So let's kick off the review with the lens. Now, Ingenue has an incredibly rich history and have been around since the late 1940s. Honestly, there would be far too much history for me to cover in this short video, so I'm going to focus on this single lens and how it was to use. It's worth noting that there have been a few versions of this lens, with the original 25-250 first appearing in 1962 with an f-stop of f3.2. But, because T and f-stop are measured differently, this lens would actually be closer to T3.7 or even T3.9, but your mileage may vary. The successor to this lens was the HP version, and later the HR version. This same 10x zoom is still featured in the modern Optimo line. So, first let's talk about the modifications to this lens, and to be honest, it's a fairly small list, but those changes made a huge difference. The focus gear has been made much thicker compared to the original, which is extremely useful as the focus puller now has the full range of movement without the gear moving off the teeth. Also changed is the entire aperture color. The original version of this lens did not have gearing on the barrel, so it's safe to say that this particular part was exchanged for a redesigned color with T-stop markings as well as adding the pitch gearing. Now, I don't have a complete list of compatible mounts, but this lens was made with a universal mount, making them accessible to many different cinematographers to use on their preferred camera systems, like the Ariflex system or the Mitchell BNC system. I don't know what company modified this lens, but I'd hazard a guess it was a company like Duclos Lenses. But with the PL mount, it's easily able to cover Super 35 sensors. However, I don't think it would fare well on full-frame cameras, even with a 1.4x extender, but that's just a guess. The biggest question that I had going into this particular film with this lens was, how easy would it be to use as a one-man operation? And the answer is, easier than I thought, until it wasn't. By far the biggest issue was the focus, the zoom, and having to choose between the two for which to operate. As this lens is parfocal, it was easy to set the focus and spend the majority of my time trying to control the zoom, but that didn't mean my focus problems were over. Because the barrel extended and rotated out, this made matte box use with a top flag impossible. My options were either to direct attach the matte box to the lens and lose control of the eyebrow as it would twist with the lens, or attach a matte box to the rails. However, there is a distinct possibility you would run into vignetting issues at the widest point when the lens telescoped back in. My solution was to repurpose my small Tilta 4x4 matte box by stripping out the filter trays and the donut. There was just enough clearance for the lens to pass through, and this ended up being a pretty decent solution to the problem of the eyebrow, though it did make filter use impossible. C'est la vie. However, there is a more elegant solution if you're willing to fork over a ton of cash in the form of the Arma Cine Orbital System, which attaches an extending but non-rotating front collar that allows for modern matte box system use. So with that problem solved, the next issue was pulling the zoom. Now, I went into this project knowing that I wanted to try to keep it as old school as possible, and I didn't want to use any electronic fizz devices. I wanted to try my luck at pulling zoom by hand, but quickly figured out that might have been a huge mistake. Luckily, I have friends who are much more knowledgeable than I am, who pointed out that for long, slow zooms, you need a crank. But not just any crank. You need a long crank with leverage, which are difficult to come by these days in modern rental houses since electronic follow focus units have become the standard. So, my solution to this was extremely simple, but admittedly a little jank. In order to extend the crank out, I gaff taped a screwdriver to the existing crank. And no, it's not pretty, but the results were instantly better though the amount of concentration it took to smoothly pull from 250 to 25 
under time, pressure, and the intense Texas heat, was enormous. In terms of stability, this lens wasn't extraordinarily front-heavy, but it still requires the use of a lens support, which helps ease the pressure from zooming in and out. This lens comes in at 6 pounds, but the total package weight of this combo was around 12 pounds. And while there weren't any handheld shots in the film, I don't think that there would have been too much trouble with shoulder mounting or using with an easy rig. All in all, when it comes to a single-person operation, it's not a lens I can recommend that you try to use alone. It's definitely a job for two people, so if you find yourself looking to use this lens, do yourself a favor and hire a first AC to help. Now, let's talk about how this lens looks. And it is genuinely stunning, in a way that I wasn't really expecting. I'll get into the nitty-gritty in a moment, but sometimes you just have to stop for a moment and really take in what you're seeing. From color and contrast to flaring and chromatic aberration, it is a phenomenal lens for this kind of period piece, and there's not a single modern lens that I can think of that would give this same character. The best word I possess to describe it is simply classic. First up is chromatic aberration, and for this particular project there isn't a ton as I rarely ran the lens wide open, but when I did, the CA was very present and not very pleasing. Generally speaking, lens chromatic aberration isn't a deal breaker for me as I'm used to my Voigtlander lenses, which have plenty of CA wide open. However, it was rather distracting on the shots that I did need to run the lens wide open as it was a very heavy purple outline. So, if chromatic aberration is a non-starter for you, I recommend that you steer clear of this lens, as it might be the single biggest area in which it suffers the most. Flaring was something that I didn't really feature much during the film, although I do have test footage of it. As I ran with the map box for the majority of the shoot, it's hard for me to say one way or the other whether this lens would have flaring that would be beneficial to the look you're going for, but I can say that the few times I saw the lens flaring, I found that it was actually controlled quite well for its age, and even when being directly struck, was fairly minimal. Occasionally, it did have wonderful bursts of rainbow pinstriping that, while didn't make the final cut, was very pretty to look at. However, sometimes it did reveal fungal scarring, which was very unsightly and hard to hide. Hopefully, whatever lens you have will have less of this. So, let's discuss vignetting. As I said before, this lens does have full Super 35 coverage, but when set to 25mm, it's very clear to see that it's beginning to push the boundaries of its sharpness, and in fact, does begin to distort pretty heavily near the corners. When zooming, there is just the slightest hair of vignette, but it's not at all distracting or unfixable. The distortion that is present definitely has a style of its own. It's not quite Helios level distortion, but I'd probably put it closer to cook, if anything. But the reality is, it's a vintage lens, and if you were expecting a now almost 45-year-old lens to not have any issues, I'm afraid you might not have realistic expectations. Which leads me to style. This lens is absolutely dripping with distinct style and character, and when scrubbing through test footage, it really impressed me how three-dimensional the image looks. There's a true pop to it while still maintaining a silky, classic look. But with a lens like this, it's not something that you should try to fight too hard to modify. There are plenty of modern lenses that you can add filtration or customize your look to, but I'd argue that's not what this lens is. The only real issue is how repeatable this will be from lens to lens. With a lens this old, it can be difficult to tell what is patina, or what is the original factory look. This is a lens where you want a light touch on its positives, and lean hard into the negatives to use them to your advantage. After doing a few tests with this lens pre-filming, it became apparent that there were two large issues with this look. The first was some type of focal aberration on the wide end, where it was extremely soft, just off to the left center frame. This particular aberration was very stubborn, and no amount of rear or front element cleaning seemed to be able to rid me of it. The second large issue was with the parfocal design. The majority of the time, this was not an issue for quick punch-in zooms, but on the longer shot like the one here, you can see there is a large segment that moves out of focus before coming back into focus at the tail end. 
It could have been that this lens was slightly misaligned during its D and reconstruction, or it could have simply slipped out of place from old age. Either way, it wasn't the end of the world for me, but definitely an annoyance. Okay, so let's talk about the Vericam here and go a little more in depth on why I chose this camera. The first thing I want to touch on is the age and variations of this camera. As I mentioned before, the Vericam LT was released in 2016 as a response to many professionals requesting a smaller and lighter body than the big brother to this camera, the Vericam 35. The biggest difference between the LT and the 35 is the ability to record 444 internally. There is a way to record RAW internally as well via a codex recorder, but that makes the camera even larger and unwieldy, but the image is stunning from what I understand. The Vericam LT can record ProRes or AVC Intra 4K 422 10-bit internally. 422 10-bit wouldn't really become common in DSLR or mirrorless cameras until many years later, though Panasonic was able to bring 422 10-bit to the GH5, which remained fairly rare until around 2020 or so for mirrorless cameras. So, let's talk about the dynamic range for a bit, and it's pretty easy to see that the 14 plus advertised stops are absolutely there, and even in 422 10-bit, it's incredible the amount of color detail and luminosity you are able to retain. I've had almost zero issues with pulling back the sky into a very usable range on a myriad of shots. This was a tough shoot exposure-wise and had a lot of different variables, but knowing that I had some protection when I needed to be overexposed was a true benefit. When compared to most modern cinema cameras, there is a slight but noticeable difference in dynamic range. However, all things considered, I'm not sure this alone would be enough to sway me in spending 150 to 200% more in rental costs just for an extra stop. Okay, so let's talk about the ISO range and ND performance. This camera came equipped with dual native ISO, which was a huge step up in flexibility. And as a side note and personal opinion, I think it's worth mentioning that Panasonic was responsible for pioneering dual gain ISO. Not Ari, not Red, not Sony, and I think Panasonic deserves way more praise for that than what they got. The higher gain was 5000 ISO, while the lower was 800 ISO. There was a part of me that wanted to try to stop down the ISO to 100 to more accurately emulate the ASA rating of the film used back in the day. However, I decided against it, and the majority of this film was shot at ISO 800, with the dream sequence shots mostly at 5000. And especially during the evening shots, the 5000 ISO absolutely saved my biscuit. It's still a little on the noisy side, but the fact this camera has it at all makes it such a fantastic tool to have in your back pocket. The ND filter system is adequate, but stops are a little close together. With 0 0.6, 1.2, and 1.8, I think I would have liked to have seen a 2.1 instead of 1.8, as that would have been a bit more useful in these harsh exteriors. And although I like the physical dial, it's tough to beat the flexibility of the electronic variable ND systems, like that found in the Sony FX6. I'd say that out of all of the features of the Vericam series, the dual native ISO is the biggest draw to potentially purchasing this camera in 2023 going into 2024. We'll get to color in a moment, but for now, we'll talk about battery life and weight, or to sum it up, performance. At the time of writing this, Texas is experiencing one of its hottest summers on record, with over 40 plus days of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or 38 degrees centigrade. On the day we filmed, it was 104 and 107 degrees Fahrenheit, respectively. The manual for the Vericam LT states an upper limit operating temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, so right off the bat, we're already in the danger zone. The Vericam LT is equipped with a large intake fan on the side for good cooling, and while we didn't experience any recording errors out in the field, the battery life took a pretty big hit when compared to a studio setting. I had anticipated this, but it was still a logistical problem, as charging batteries requires electricity, but also cooling. Used batteries get pretty hot, charging batteries get even hotter. 
my average time on the new gold mount 150 watt hour batteries was about one and a half hours apiece. The second day proved to be even hotter, and we had to make sure we gave the camera time to cool down. Also worth noting, these P2 cards can get extremely hot, so make sure that when you grab it, you don't touch the metal part, because you will get burned. However, the camera wasn't the only thing to get overheated, and I want to talk for a second about safety. This particular film came with a huge concern for my actors and filming in the heat. We made sure that we had tons of water and salty snacks available, and luckily I also have a vehicle in good working condition that was able to run for long periods of time and stays very cold. Despite that, I personally came extremely close to heat stroke and began experiencing cold chills and nausea, even with adequate water consumption and small breaks. Being in the sun with sunscreen and protective clothing still wasn't enough to prevent becoming overheated. I was able to get myself cooled off, and luckily there was a convenience store close to our location which had the ultimate snack for heat exhaustion, ice cream Snickers. Hits the spot every time. I think a major contributing factor to becoming overheated was also the weight of the camera package. With the lens, lens support, matte box, batteries, and moving lights, generators, and generally being a one-man camera crew, it was much easier to become overworked. I think I need to stress again the importance that this lens isn't something that you should be using alone and at minimum requires a first AC. And once more, please take care of yourselves. No film is worth getting hurt or dying over. Okay, so let's move on to color, because this is where the Vericam shines. The color science of the Vericam are second to none, and while I have always favored Panasonic colors, it's not without good reason. Skin tones across the board were extremely natural, but when pushed for saturation and contrast, never fell apart or became muddy or blended. The skies remained a very vibrant blue, and the trees and grass always sustained a lovely deep natural green. And here are some before and afters. I feel like the Vericam has always been a bit of a sleeper cinema camera. For whatever reason, it never really felt like it gained the traction it should have when compared to Sony's offerings, and especially Alexa and RED, even with major studios and television shows using them. My personal opinion was that it had a lot to do with the initial pricing and marketing. Panasonic's cameras have almost always been considered to be fairly bulletproof, especially compared to RED cameras. They are also extremely easy to use with the menu system that is actually very easy to navigate. My only complaint is the longer boot up times, but that's only a problem if you're switching resolutions often. For docu work, it very well might cost you a shot if you're trying to move from 4K to 2K slow motion. The biggest advantage the LT has over DSLRs and box cameras in 2023 are its internal ND filters its native gold mount or V-mount battery plate, dual native ISO, and Panasonic's wonderful color science. There are very few cameras that come with all of these features in one box, but in 2023, I think the new trick up its sleeve is that they rent out for extraordinarily cheap compared to almost any other cinema camera within the last decade. Unfortunately, it seems like the Vericam division has all but been abandoned unless you are in need of service for your cameras, which are still performed, but at a significant cost. 
I genuinely hope that Panasonic has another trick up its sleeve, and I hope that they are able to release another true cinema camera. Using this lens on this particular film was actually a really great experience for me. A lot of times it's hard to put yourself into another filmmaker's shoes and understand why they did what they did and why they used the tools that they used. I can safely say for that this project, despite the harsh temperatures and rather heavy camera package, that seeing the images come to life with that 10x zoom was a true highlight that allowed me to catch a glimpse of what it might have been like having Clint Eastwood stare down the lens barrel. The combination of the Ingenue 10x 25-250mm and the Panasonic Vericam LT is truly one of my favorite systems that I've tested so far. And if you have the means and motivation to create something with this set, I highly recommend that you give it a shot.